Okay, great. Marty. Hi. Uh, well, just real quick, I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, Sandy Rizzo from Cloudera, and uh, uh, one of the uh, Hadoop and one of the Spark committers as well. Is there a clicker thing, or I can just use this? Okay, I'm not actually a Spark committer, but I appreciate it. Um, first of all. Thank you, everyone, for coming and not spending this beautiful day outside. I'm flattered that you are at my talk, uh, not in the sun. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about end-to-end uh, -end analytics on uh, Apache Spark. Uh, some quick stuff about myself uh, before we keep going. Uh, I am on the data science team at Cloudera. Uh, before that, I was uh, our first Spark developer. Our Spark team is actually uh, about four people now. It's pretty exciting. Uh, before that, I was working on uh, Apache Hadoop, uh, working on Yarn and MapReduce. I'm on the Hadoop Project Management Committee, uh, and I was a wee undergrad right before that. Uh, so the topic of this talk is large-scale learning. Uh, how, do we, how do we define large-scale learning? I come from sort of a systems background, so I like to think of it as uh, machine learning on so much data that you really have to use a distributed system to tackle it. Uh, what for? In the wild, what kinds of problems are actually uh, so big, have so much data that we need, uh, that we need a distributed system to tackle them? Um, so a nice thing about being uh, in data science at Cloudera is we get a sort of horizontal view of a lot of the different ways that institutions uh, use machine learning. Uh, and so maybe 80% of the use cases fall into a few categories that I'm going to survey. Um, machine learning, uh, is great for detecting things that, are, uh, that have been going right but are likely to go wrong soon. Probably the biggest use case here is churn prediction. Uh, this is how Sidecar knows how to send me $5 every weekend. Um, I still don't use it. Um, <clears throat> uh, detecting machine failures. Uh, institutions want to know uh, for an aircraft or for a cell phone tower or for a manufacturing facility, uh, what components are most likely to fail sometime soon. Uh, and huge data is great at uh, helping to avoid uh, the kinds of catastrophes uh, that can come from this. Um, second of all, identifying bad actors. Uh, the, world is, the world is full of, of evil people, and they do all sorts of evil things. Um, and so a difficult and really important task for huge data is uh, identifying these villains and labeling them as the villains they are. Uh, the, probably the main uh, uses here are uh, institutions want to uh, look at packets, figure out who's trying to intrude on their network. Uh, they want to figure out who's trying to commit credit card fraud. They want to uh, discover abuses of their advertising system, and they want to find faulty insurance claims. Provide recommendations. This is the third one. This is huge. Uh, any institution with tons of customers uh, needs to do this. Uh, this is how um, Amazon knows that because I bought a dress for my ex-girlfriend a couple years ago to keep showing me that same dress. Um, which is a really important task for machine learning. <laughs> so <clears throat> we, uh, <clears throat> we like to make a distinction between machine learning in uh, the lab and machine learning in, in the factory. Uh, in the lab, we're performing uh, predictive analytics, or sorry, not predictive analytics, uh, investigative analytics. Um, this is when we're formulating questions, we're trying to evaluate different models, uh, we're looking at all the features that are available to us and figuring out which are the ones that are actually useful uh, for training our models. Um, in the factory, we're engaged in operational analytics. Uh, we have a sort of general sense of uh, how we want to solve our problem, and we want to turn this into a, a production application. Uh, instead of uh, looking at the broad space of all possible approaches that are out there, uh, we're trying to take the particular approach that we've uh, chosen and optimize it uh, to produce results, possibly in real time. Uh, for our application. So what does it mean to productionize uh, your machine learning? Uh, some models can be safely applied in batch. Uh, <clears throat> you can probably run your term predictor uh, every, uh, every day, maybe every hour, at night, uh, figure out which of your customers uh, you're at risk of losing, and then take action to try to recover them. Uh, <clears throat> many use cases need real-time serving. Uh, especially in the case of uh, credit card fraud or faulty insurance claims, uh, you have bad actors that are trying to do something and you want to immediately be able to classify them as such uh, so you can prevent them from doing what they're trying to do. Uh, 
recommendations also fall into this category. Uh, someone shows up at your, uh, your homepage, uh, and you want to immediately be able to tell them what kind of products uh, they should be looking at. Um, in addition to real-time serving, a bunch of use cases also need real-time updates. Uh, especially recommendations, uh, whenever somebody uh, clicks on something on your website, that's immediately a piece of signal that you can use to uh, build a better profile of that person. And being able to uh, recommend movies based on immediate clicks uh, is really useful uh, case for real-time updates in machine learning. Um, so this is, where, this is where infrastructure comes in. Uh, for our purposes, infrastructure is going to be uh, services that are trying to do something reliable. Um, so I think there are sort of three different kinds of infrastructure for the three different problems that we're trying to solve uh, in productionizing machine learning. Uh, first of all, there's model building. Uh, we need an infrastructure that can reliably uh, build models on a scheduled time. Whether we want to rebuild our model on the entire data every hour, every day, um, we need something that can do that without fail. Uh, this is maybe the easiest. Uh, Apache Uzi is a pretty, uh, is a pretty good <coughs> tool for doing this kind of stuff. Uh, second of all, Model serving. We need infrastructure that can sit uh, behind our application, uh, and whenever uh, <clears throat> a credit card tra transaction comes in or a insurance claim, uh, we can pass it uh, to our model serving infrastructure and have it immediately uh, make a decision about that. Um, and last of all, model updating infrastructure. Infrastructure that uh, <clears throat> uh, doesn't view our model as a static thing, but as real-time updates come in, can uh, modify it. <clears throat> Uh, in order to provide better uh, recommendations or classifications. Um, so Oryx is a project that, uh, open source project we've been working at Cloudera that tries to satisfy some of these needs. Uh, sort of the, the central thesis of Oryx is that it makes sense to include model building, model serving, model updating into a single, uh, into a single system. Uh, and doing that has a few, uh, has a few different advantages. Um, first of all, Data scientists and people building uh, <coughs> websites or production applications tend to be uh, in two different parts of an organization. So uh, allowing, uh, having two different uh, projects, allowing you to asynchronously update models um, independent from application development is really important. Uh, second of all, machine learning often requires uh, sets of uh, pre-processing steps. You want to normalize your data. You might want to uh, project it into some space, figure out which clusters it's closest to. Uh, a single system allows you to have a consistent view uh, of the transformations that you need to make both on your uh, model building and model serving side. Uh, and third of all, more advanced, uh, this isn't something we've implemented yet, uh, but experiments are really important. Uh, you have a few different models you want to try out. You want to tweak, tweak certain parameters. Um, Serve differently to people uh, in, in different parts of the world. Having machine learning infrastructure uh, allows you uh, to run these experiments and try to uh, figure out uh, what model really is best for, uh, for your use case. So <clears throat> this is the state of, uh, of Oryx 1.0. Uh, Oryx 1.0 relies on uh, custom-built uh, algorithms uh, in MapReduce. Uh, and it uses those for its, uh, its batch model building when you are uh, building a model on the entire data. Uh, and then for model update, for a real-time update, when a click comes in and you want to be able to provide recommendations immediately based on that click, uh, we simply uh, have our model servers uh, partitioned by user. Uh, so uh, when I click, all my stuff goes to a particular, uh, particular server. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, whenever you want to uh, score a product from me, you send me to that server. So that server knows about me, but the other ones don't. Uh, here's sort of the uh, Oryx 1.0 architecture diagram. Uh, so having our own implementations of these MapReduce algorithms is super nice and all, but it's kind of a waste of everybody's time. It's a waste of our time uh, that we're implementing these when scalable, nice implementations uh, exist uh, out outside of Oryx. Uh, and it's also a waste of our user's time that they're using a framework like MapReduce, which really isn't good for uh, the variety of iterative computations uh, that are used uh, in various <laughs> machine learning algorithms. And so this, of course, is what brings us to uh, Spark and MLib. For those of you who aren't familiar, MLib is a sub-project of Spark that concerns itself with uh, having a bunch of high-quality implementations of common machine learning algorithms. Uh, this is sort of the uh, st state of the art in MLib right now. Um, I like to you know, divide up machine learning along these two axes, uh, 
supervised learning, unsupervised learning, uh, discrete and continuous. Uh, it's got something for everybody. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff coming soon. Um, so the idea is that MLib uh, currently does, or, or very soon uh, will, encompass everything that is in Oryx. Um, we're going to have higher quality implementations, more implementations, um, and they're going to be built on Spark, uh, which is really better for solving these kinds of problems than MapReduce. So the central idea of Oryx 2.0 is that we're going to replace the MapReduce algorithms with MLib. Uh, and replace the real-time update as well with Spark streaming. Um, this brings us to Lambda architecture. It's kind of a, it's kind of a buzzwordy term, uh, <clears throat> but also I think it's uh, really, really valuable. The idea basically is that we, uh, we maintain two views on our data. Uh, we have uh, our batch data, or, sorry, our, our entire data, and we're able to periodically uh, retrain our entire models or you know, outside of a mach machine learning contest, uh, context, uh, do aggregations. Uh, on the entirety of our data once every hour, once every day. Um, and then on top of this batch layer, we have a speed layer that's concerned with dealing with data as it comes in, uh, in real time, uh, and allowing us uh, to have a, like an up-to-date view of our data. Uh, so <clears throat> in Oryx 2.0, the batch layer is handled by Spark, and the, uh, and the speed layer is handled by Spark Streaming. So here's the, the, the colorful, beautiful, uh, architecture, tentative architecture diagram of uh, Oryx 2.0. Um, at the center is this model building component. And the model builder is doing two things. It's every hour, every day, however long you want to configure it uh, to. Uh, it's uh, rebuilding the model on the entire data. Um, simultaneously, it's handling updates through Spark streaming. So we assume that you can have a huge amount of updates. People are clicking on stuff on your website all the time. Um, you're getting measurements from uh, sensors on your machines all the time, uh, and that all goes through Kafka and into, uh, into Spark Streaming. Spark Streaming concerns itself with uh, processing these and uh, distilling from that firehose information what updates we need to make to the model. Uh, so both, uh, both the batch component are rebuilding the model from scratch, uh, and Spark Streaming uh, and, and functions there uh, concern themselves with uh, incremental updates to that model. Uh, finally, uh, when we have these changes to the model, uh, we push them out through Kafka, uh, and these go to all the model servers, uh, which can be scaled uh, independently of the demons that are actually in charge of uh, <coughs> handling updates uh, and training our models. So <coughs> this is the last thing I'm going I'm to leave you with. Um, the last uh, few takeaways that I want are, first of all, there's a difference between uh, building libraries of machine learning algorithms and actually uh, getting those into a state and building up uh, all the stuff around them that allows you to include those in a production application. Uh, but also that the distinction between these two is pretty blurry. Uh, and these are a couple, these are a few different things uh, that we're thinking about putting in Oryx or have put in Oryx already, but it might actually make more sense uh, to put in uh, MLib as well. Uh, so. Uh, the first is PMML output. PM PMML is this uh, sort of a, maybe ancient is, uh, is a little too far back, but it's, it's a, a venerable standard uh, <clears throat> for expressing uh, machine learning algorithms. And the advantage of uh, being able to output into a standard like PMML is that a variety of different frameworks can consume a model uh, and serve it independent of who's actually building the model. Uh, second of all, model update. In some cases, especially when we're using uh, online learning algorithms or streaming, uh, streaming algorithms, it's very simple. You use the same code for, uh, for updating your model as new data comes in as you would for training in batch in the first place. Uh, but in other cases, uh, it's not so straightforward. And having, uh, paying uh, specific attention to how after a model is already built, you can update it in real time, I think would be a really nice thing to go into MLib. Uh, Last of all, all this stuff uh, that comes around, not just with building models, uh, but with the entire, uh, the entire data science workflow around uh, tuning, uh, constructing, putting together a machine learning algorithm. Uh, Cross-validation, hyperparameter tuning, splitting into train and test sets. Uh, this is stuff that I think uh, uh, MLib is already thinking about a lot, um, as well as people at Berkeley. Uh, and I think that uh, just, Calling it out as an area of focus is really important. It's more important, let's say, than ad adding fancy new algorithms in certain cases. Um, 
so yeah, I think that's all I've got for you. Uh, if you want to contribute, github.com slash cloudera slash oryx. Um, and any questions? So uh, the question was, what's the, uh, the long-term vision of Oryx? Uh, will Oryx and MLlib become so similar? What's the real value of Oryx? Um, <clears throat> so the things that I put in the last slide are things that uh, could uh, well go into MLlib. Uh, in terms of actual infrastructure for uh, <clears throat> model serving and model update, I think that's unlikely to go into MLlib. If MLlib took that direction, I think maybe we would just decide to s scrap Oryx and say, let's throw everything here. Um, but MLlib is more concerned with providing um, uh, statistics, providing machine learning algorithms, whereas Oryx is more concerned with, uh, okay, now that you have those, how do you build a production application out of those? How do you have, um, how do you create services uh, that are gonna sit there, update your model, and, uh, and serve it? Um, the question was, is there a, a component in Oryx for testing your models so you can uh, validate a model that's not going to do worse uh, before you push it out? Uh, no, but I think that would be a good thing to add. Sweet. Thanks a lot. <laughs>